Hey, everybody. How you doing? Welcome to a brand new Ike Live show. Uh, thanks for joining us. All right. I know what you're thinking. I got I to gotta address this right off the giddy. Um, you're looking around. You're saying, man, this Ike Live looks a little different. And it is different. This is different. Uh, I'm very, very excited to sort of bring you a new version of Ike Live. And uh, this is kind of a more up close, personalized uh, Ike Live. And this is more of a one on one. Uh, this is going to be great. Uh, th this is going to be a kind of show, I think, where we can really dive into our guests a little more, learn about our guests a little more. Uh, and I'm excited. It's sort of an evolution of Ike Live. Now, if you're big fans of the old crew, don't worry. They're going to be making a lot of guest appearances throughout these podcasts. So uh, Brian the Carpenter and uh, Stormtrooper, uh, the Dean, Pete Glusick, uh, Miss Miss Rebecca, even Powerbait Paul, guys like that. You're going to see them making a uh, little stop by here on the show. So, uh, But we are back in the old studio. Feels good to be back here. Uh, I, I, I said right before the show started, I kind of feel a little of the vibe that my producer, Brian the Carpenter, felt all those years. There's a little bit of pressure because now I'm not just talking, but I'm actually pushing the buttons. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe a good analogy. It's like trying to figure out live scope. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I, I kind of don't know what I'm doing here, but right behind me, uh, my uh, Becky is pretty smart. So she's making sure things go smooth on this first show. And we got a great guest for you on this first show of this new format. Uh, we got uh, Gussie joining us in just a second here and uh, so excited for him winning the Bassmaster Classic, a uh, life-changing thing uh, I, I can relate to. It's a very life-changing moment. So we're going to talk to Jeff in just a little bit. Very excited. Uh, before we do that, you know, we have two great sponsors that bring this show to you. Of course, Mystery Tackle Box. Man, I love Mystery Tackle Box. They've been a supporter of the show from day one. Uh, best way I can describe it, man, it brings new lures, new techniques, things that you maybe don't know about or would try. It brings them to your doorstep once a month. Uh, head over to mysterytacklebox.com. Use the promo code Ike Live. You ready for this? This is amazing. 50% off your first pro box. That's the black box. 30% off your first elite box. Use that promo code. Head over there. Dude, what a great gift. What a great way to put lures in your hand. Also brought to you by uh, the Ike Foundation. Uh, Ike Foundation's out there to get more kids fishing. Real quick reminder, uh, we have a, our first kids tournament coming up uh, Saturday, May 20th. It's on Lums Pond in Delaware. If you're watching this right now, if you know a kid that wants to fish, head on over there, ikefoundation.org. Sign that kid up. Uh, they could be a tournament rat. They could fish on the weekends. They could never fish ever in their life. We want them at this tournament. May 20th, Lums Pond. Also, if you're listening to this, you live in the tri-state area. You're in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, you've got a boat. We need boat captains uh, for these kids. So if you want to help get the youth involved in fishing, head on over to ikefoundation.org. Also, real quick reminder, our Celebrity Pro-Am sneaking up on us, folks. Uh, June 10th, Saturday, June 10th, on the upper Chesapeake Bay. Um, and let me tell you, if you're in the Northeast, there, aren't, there are not a lot of tournaments that give away a fully rigged bass boat, bass cat boat, Yamaha outboard for first place. Yes, we're giving that boat away again and motor away again at this year's Pro-Am. It's not too early to sign up. Uh, head over to ikefoundation.org and you can get more information on how to sign up for the Pro-Am. So uh, I'm going to I'm gonna patch uh, Gussie through here if I can figure this out. Um, I, I am so dumb with technology it's unbelievable so let's see hit add to stream okay gussie can you hear me loud and clear we're here oh it worked oh my god this is like hey. active, this is like active target i don't i look down and i see a fish i'm like oh my god it works <laughs> hey i'm i'm right with you with the techie stuff man i'm uh yeah i'm challenged so this, it, is, it, this is amazing it's crazy because, uh, you know, a, a great – this is a great way to start showing. I don't even have this in my notes, but what a interesting thing 
to watch you win on in Knoxville when you had 2D versus winning with active target. It was it was cool for me to watch it as a fan um, because, you know, and I'm just being honest here, you were just as good with 2D as you were use, utilizing that new technology. Where, where do you stand with, with all this? Because you've got guys that hate it, uh, a.k.a. Randy Bockett. You've got guys that love it, a.k.a half of the elite field that we're fishing against and you've got everything in between. Where do you stand on the technology? Um, like the part that I hate is I was that, like I never had my own vehicle till I was like 25. I had a little beater bass boat that I ripped around and you know, like which one of my buddies has a truck we can use to get the boat in the lake this weekend, you know, like, yeah, I, I, I hate the cost of everything. And, um, you know, I don't want anyone to feel like they can't compete in a tournament because they don't have, forward facing sonar and and yeah the reality is there's going to be some events in some places where you pretty much have to have it to be competitive um i know up where i live at lake of the woods if you, i mean for those later august and september tournaments when the yeah. fish are getting pulled out a bit and stuff like if you don't have it you're probably going to be in trouble um but that being said the boat doesn't catch the fish i mean there, there's people um you know, like I see people getting into bass fishing that like have the means and they're putting five screens on their boat. And it's like, it's crazy, dude, you got to learn how to catch some fish just like with a wacky rig before you worry about having <laughs> five screens, you know, is so, that, like, that that's crazy. That's crazy to me. Is that, is that mind blowing that you see these guys showing up to tournaments with that stuff? Yeah, for sure. Like, like probably a lot of them don't know how to use any, even, even use it, you know, it looks good, oh but like, God. But I hate that I don't, you know, because I was that kid. Like, I, I, I hate that, um, you know, like someone might not get into the sport because they feel like they don't, they can't afford right. to like have all the bells and whistles. And, right. Um, but as far as like, I, you know, I mean, you learn a lot from it. It's fun to use. Um, I, all that stuff. I mean, I, I enjoy learning from the, from the, watching the screen, watch how the fish react to your baits and, yeah. And, and and see if there's any fish where you're you know yeah like, so many people are worried about their lure and the color and all that and like sometimes that's important but like if you're not putting your bait in front of a fish you're not going to catch anything it doesn't right. matter what you're using right so right yeah i i agree with you i think it's a technology that you have to use like a tool like we've used other things in the past like we've used 2d or side imaging or uh, aqua view or any of those right it's just a tool uh but but do you agree that nothing replaces that natural instinct? Because like I, I worry, and I'm saying this um, not just as a, a guy that's involved in the sport. I'm saying this as a dad because the one thing, like my son, Jeff, is uh, Vegas is 12, and yeah. God, he loves it. Dude, he loves it. Like he, he is a, almost addicted to it. And so now I find myself coaching him and teaching him not to use it right like i hate to say that but i don't want him to become reliant on it to the point where it's a crutch or it's you know i want him to develop that natural instinct would you agree with that yeah like you still got to be able to like if you want to make it any at any higher level in this you got to be able to flip you got to be able to yeah. skip a bait under a dock i mean you got to be able to make a good cast and hit a hole back in a you know with a frog like you got to be yeah. able to do all that stuff too so yeah um you know i had a friend last year that fished an open at hartwell last september and he gets this young guy on day two and his live scope battery issue something it didn't work and yeah. the kid had a decent first day and like you know was was right around the cut money line and his machine didn't work the second day and literally at 11 in the morning he's like well we're aft i'm done and just went and tied the boat up to the dock like just just gave up like there's no imagine? way i can catch it. i mean can oh, you imagine no if i had if i had one flip and stick with with 80 pound braid on it and i was at lake hartwell looking for spot i mean i keep still going up until two minutes before i had to be oh yeah I mean? like keep going yeah oh like that kid's never gonna make it yeah, but. that's that's hard to teach. That's that that's that never give up mentality. That's that push, you know, the big push mentality. 
that's a hard thing to teach. I think you have to have that. That's like an inherent thing. And if you don't have it, you don't have it. And it sounds like, uh, sounds like he's in trouble because he doesn't have it. Uh, here's a good question. Right before we came on live here, I asked where you were and, uh, you're, you're kind of hanging out in South Carolina a little bit, uh, because we're so close to uh, our next one on lay. But yeah. I mean, since you won the classic, literally, dude, we've been running, um, you know, between sponsor obligations and back to back on Murray Santee now lay we've been running, uh, but we are like a month removed. Has it set in yet? Cause I, I I'm, I'm looking at you and you seem so calm and relaxed. Like I, I think when I won in, in 03, I think when I won, I was like jit skitzing out for like the next 12 months. Like I couldn't even stand still. You look pretty chill. Has it set in the, the win? Um, yeah. Like it, it does. I still kind of can't believe it all. Like, especially the way it went on the last day and like, you know, just it's like the classic, like, you know, it's yeah. the it's the biggest dream that we have for what we do. Right. And yeah. um, but like the two weeks after was pretty crazy. Um, it, it's been kind of stressful, like just trying to schedule stuff with like you made this was easy. And obviously, yeah. like, you know, getting to talk to you or Mercer, or some of these, you know, like shows that I'm a fan of, you, you make it work. Um, but this other stuff's been stressful, just trying to like schedule it and that but yeah. um but yeah i was glad to get back to fishing again at murray you can you know the week of our tournaments you can kind of um it's a little easier to like avoid everything and shut everything else off yeah um, so that was good and you know now we're, it's uh you know i'm kind of jealous like you can tell me more but my perception is like when you back when you won or even like in the 90s like I think, you know, the, the saying used to be like, it's worth a million dollars if you yeah. were classic. And yeah. I, I know I'm not going to see a million dollars this year, but like, um, was it just like a crazy number of appearances and, is, it, and you, you make money from like, how did, how did that all go for you? Yeah. It's interesting because here, here's another great thing. And I, and I don't know in the universe, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what this means, by the way, speaking of the universe, today's May the 4th. And it's May the Fourth be with you. So I have a I have a little Chewbacca uh, doll here for my nice. May the Fourth. All right, I don't even know what that noise was. Uh, I won in two thousand three. You won in two thousand twenty three. Exactly twenty years. Okay. That is so freaking cool. I love that. Uh, we're, in in two thousand three, Jeff, where, what were you doing? Where were you? Uh, I was, I was fishing every day that I could up at Lake of the Woods. And that was around the time when you came up there and fished with a number of my friends. Um, oh and, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And, uh, great times. Great yeah, times. I was a big fan. I mean, I follow, I'd followed all the tournaments. I still have your win on a VHS tape somewhere <laughs> in my parents' basement. Yes. And, uh, yes. you know, I was, I was living, my life revolved around bass and we have some really good tournaments up there in the summer. That's how I kind of yeah. got my passion and bugged for it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it was 10 years later before I crossed the border to like come and try and make it. Right. Make it here. That, and, that's but, awesome. You, know. you, you were grinding as a young man when I won the classic. I love to hear those stories. Uh, yeah. it, it, dude, it's, it, it is a life changing event. And here's what I, here's what I'll tell you. And, and um, you know, when I won, like I could feel like, you know, I woke up the next morning and I could feel that it was my life was going to be different. Like, I, I don't know a great way to explain it, but I just knew, you know, I, I was in a little different position because when I won in 2003, my life was in the shitter. Seriously, like, I, like you, your life right now is great. You have a loving spouse and you have families and friends support. And I had I had family and friend support, but you know, person, my personal life was in the shitter. So I was in a different place personally, but you feel that you have this chance to do something big. And, you know, so like literally on the drive home a few days later, I got to drive home with a good friend of mine, John McGraw, and then Pete Glusick, who, you know, Pete from Bash university. Yeah. Uh, we drove like 20 hours home and we were strategizing you know, how to use this win to, you know, not just make money and grow your own business and brand, but how to use this win to like blow the doors off of it, you know? And, and, you know, that was the mindset. So like, I remember getting home 
And uh, very similar probably to what you had, you know, just the, the nonstop calls and emails. And I said yes to everything. I said yes. My mindset was I'm not saying no to a single thing mm -hmm. from a standpoint of interviews and appearances. And I mean, it was unbelievable. Like the next year, I can't even believe I had a decent year the next year because I don't think I think when I looked at my calendar, I think I was home like three weeks total from August to August. Mm -hmm. uh, back then, the classic was in the summer. So taking every opportunity, um, you know, even to the point where I had stepped above and beyond bass to get that exposure. And so that's something, you know, that I want to throw at you, uh, you know, at the time bass was owned by ESPN. So they were like this crazy media machine that were, was really feeding me stuff. Uh, has that happened? Has, 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 and, and, you know, this is, I'm, I'm not disrespecting bass at all, but looking at it from afar, I feel like they should be doing more for, for their classic champs, but have they been feeding you stuff? Are they actively involved? Do they have a media team that's helping you with any of this stuff? Um, yeah. Like Emily hand is, is, who's sort of the media coordinator. I mean, I, yeah, it's, uh, it's been fairly steady. Like she's been sending stuff over like, here's yeah. an opportunity for you here, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's been, they've been keeping me busy in that regard, I guess. Um, yeah. I mean, we had a couple like TV, maybe opportunities reach out. So there's some interviews to do with some of that stuff. And maybe yeah. it's going to come like, I know that uh, I'm going to have some good opportunities in the foreseeable future. The pressure's off for the foreseeable future. I mean, like, you know what it's like. Every single day on the Elite Series is stressful. Every day. Every day. It doesn't matter how good you did the week before, the day before. Yeah. Um, so that's like one of the one of the nicest privileges is I get to kind of fish the rest of this year for, you know, stress-free. I mean, cool. Next year. You never want to fish cool. Um And... But I mean, at Murray, the first day, I have a camera in the boat, and I like, I thought like 14 or 15 pounds was going to be, you know, be hanging around the cut line and pretty decent. And I caught that, and I just probably, like, I didn't have the killer going that day. Like, I, the foot wasn't on the, yeah. You know, it was, I'm going through the motions a little bit. And I come in, and I have like whatever, 14 something. I'm in like 80th place or something like that. I'm not it's even crazy. Close. It's crazy. And, uh, I had a much better day too, and and uh, you know just ended up missing it by a bit. But like, I, I I as much as like yeah, the pressure's off. I still you know want to want to do well and yeah, and, uh, and all yeah, that, but. yeah. But I I tell you, winning the classic is you know you, you you mentioned that million dollar thing, and I think it's it's you can make it that right. It's like what you want to do, and I've seen classic winners from. The, the whole spectrum, Jeff. I've seen guys that are like uh, Takahiro Mori is a great example. He won the classic. I had a conversation with him literally the next day, and he's like, Mike, I just want to fish. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I've seen the other side, Wu Daves, when he won the classic in Chicago back in 2000, I think uh, two, one or two. Um, that dude was a maniac. Gussie, that dude's a maniac. I mean, I've never seen a dude work so hard and probably literally pulled a million within the next 12 to 24 months, right? Yeah. So, you know, you can do what you want with it, but it is a great opportunity, right? It's a great opportunity for you personally. So, you know, I, I touched on it, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm honestly not even joking. Like, like, look into getting a PR person or an agent. Even if it's a short-term thing, look look into it. I would definitely look into that, right? It's like, man, this is your opportunity to shine. You've got this year. Uh, look yeah. into that um, from a sponsor perspective, you know. And I'm and and I know a lot of the sponsors watch this show, and they they're always mad at me for being honest and saying stuff like this. But all your deals should go up by twenty five percent at a minimum. They sh they have to, right? Like that's a must. Um, so, you know, I think you've got an opportunity to have, you know, a lot more leverage with, with your sponsorships to get new sponsors. I mean, all that stuff is going to happen, but it really is to, to the level that, 
that you want to take it, you know, and there's no right answer there. You know, I, I mean, I look back on it and for sure, did my performance get hurt? Oh, oh, you know, the rest, of, even the rest of my whole career, right? When I decided to take that leap. Yes, it did. Because, you know, you're throwing yourself into a place where you're fishing less and, and you're thinking about fishing less. Yeah. But I don't regret any of it because I was able to build a brand and a, a sponsor portfolio and fans and all these things because I worked. I worked my ass off for the next couple of years and it did pay off. It was a million dollar win, uh, I would say, within the next half a dozen years, you know. Uh, yeah. So so there's the answer to that. But here's the bigger thing. And I, I, I do want to corner you on this. I mentioned Takahiro. And even, even though Takahiro didn't take the business opportunities and the media opportunities, dude, he changed the sport, right? Like when I, when I look back on that win, like there were always Japanese anglers bass fishing and there was always Japanese anglers coming here to fish. But look back in the history and when he won, dude, you saw this new surge of European anglers, uh, uh, Asian anglers, wanting to do this for a living and competing. Mm -hmm. do, 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 I mean, have you come to grips with, you know, you're the first Canadian to win the classic. Like, you're going to change the world a little bit in fishing. That, that's going to happen. Like, whether you know it or not, I know it sounds like a lot of pressure, but you've, <laughs> changed, you've changed the world. Like, we're going to look back in 10 or 15 years and say, man, look at all these Canadians fishing the tour. It's because of Gussie's win. It, it's going to happen. Is that Has that sunk in? That's that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah, I mean, like the one thing that happens, like so if Chris or Corey and I, you know, we've been doing it for quite a few years, and I mean, those guys are super good. If if one of us even does well in an elite event, I mean, the 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 noise is incredible. Like we hear it from everybody. We have a, There's a lot of people in Canada that – and I mean, even in the – up north like for for me i have a lot of friends and support in minnesota um wisconsin but like in canada a lot of people love bass fishing and you know I, not everyone's gonna have the same opportunity that i did to to come and try and make it but like um yeah you're, you're gonna see i'm sure there's i think there's five of them fishing all nine opens this year and i'm sure yep. there'll probably be a few more next year yeah um, so it's yeah i mean it's cool it's I kind of said it on stage and, you know, like you don't, it's, it's cliche, but just like, yeah, you, you work hard at something and dreams can happen for sure, man. And like, yeah. that's kind of where I'm at with it. But like, um, so cool, man. So yeah. it's, it's so cool. And, and, and I don't know if you knew this either, but you're in a very, very unique group now. So I have, I just have a couple notes written on this. Uh, you're right up there with Wayne Gretzky, Seth Rogen, and Justin Bieber, you're in that same category. Did you ever think you'd be compared or in the same category as Justin Bieber? Uh, no, no. I'll take it, bro. You should have had some Bieber music to play for that. I know. I know. If I was a good producer, I'd have something. This, this little Chewbacca is the best sound effect I have right now. Uh, that's a good group to be in, though, because like when I won the Classic, they had me as one of the most hated athletes in the world. Yeah. And I was, I was with terrible guys. I was with, I can't remember the football player's name that, you know, was, was fighting the dogs and killing dogs. I, like I was in like, I was with bad dudes. Yeah. You're with great people. Like <laughs> they put me with all the derelicts. That's not cool, yeah. man. You know, yeah. uh, I, I, I know you've probably been asked this on other podcasts, but I'm curious because, um, you know, I was in that situation and a lot of times, you know, when, when you get a big paycheck like that, uh, any big purchases, anything like outrageous, like I've talked to some classic champs and they literally went right out and bought like a house or a car or something, anything crazy like that. Um, no, but like, I'm too scared of the tax implications. I'm going to have to deal with at the end of this year, you know, yeah. um, yeah. but no, we're, we've been sort of planning to do a, we live in like one of the smallest houses in Canada. So we're, we're, we've been planning to do a little, um, add on and reno on our house. So, um, that, that's sort of probably the main thing, but, but no, yeah. I mean, we we're hanging out in Charleston this week. Um, I'm very lucky. Like Shelby, my wife gets to travel with, she comes to most of the events, has yeah. a pretty flexible job. So 
um, you know, we, we're staying in probably nicer places than um, than we would have a couple of years ago, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And you got you to gotta be careful. I think, you know, some of the guys, I look at some of the classic winners and they were sort of, uh, you know, they didn't manage their money. And they weren't worried. And it's good to have that, yeah. you know, safety right. feeling there, you know? It's a lot of money, but like, it's, it's like you're not retiring on it or anything. You know? Right. You know right. How winnings are like, it's kind of easy come, easy go. And yeah. uh, it'll, we'll put some of it to good use. And, and, yeah. and like I say, it, it takes the pressure off for the foreseeable future. So it's awesome. It's All awesome. Good. Now, uh, you were talking about my classic win in 2003. And I, I look back and I remember that night, uh, you know, that night was crazy. The celebration, the excitement of the, the, the after time you know the after party yeah uh i, I was in a different mindset because i was single i was out of my mind I was in a little different mindset but um I, I gotta tell you you mentioned mercer earlier and man i've been hearing some strange rumors about some kind of like party that's was very similar to like a stanley cup party happening and I, i'm friends with a i'm friends with like bickle and a couple of the canadian hockey players and i know what goes down when yeah. those guys win the stanley cup uh yeah. and Part of this rumor is Mercer being naked in the back seat of a car or a truck. Is any of this true? Because I cornered him on his own podcast and he blushed. He got his cheeks got redder to mine and he didn't say yes or no. Any of that true? Uh, no, he kept his clothes on for sure. Um, <laughs> but we did have a good party. So there was a lot of Canadians at the classic this year. There was four yeah. was pushing it. Um, and they, I did not know this till the next day. Like I was, by the time, we ended up up this place. It was, I was, it was like 11 or midnight. I mean, I was having, I was feeling no pain, but like, um, they had a, they had like this big five story building rented a couple blocks up from where we were all staying. And, uh, they called it the Canada house. So, uh, I thought we were just going to a bar, but the, we had a big entourage that went from the champions toast up the street to this place. And Mercer came to that for a little bit. And, yeah. uh, he was he was part of the celebrations, but he kept it pretty. Uh, he kept it he kept it tight. Um, the fu the best part of it, like it was a really fun night. I ended up having quite a few friends that came down and and uh, you know some family and stuff. But uh, Carl had a bunch of Aussies that that came over to support him, and I went over there with them last fall. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Fished, for, fished for a week and a half, and I met quite a few of these guys. So they came over. And, uh, and they're a good time. Like these guys are, are fun people. And they ended up coming a lot of, you know, maybe like 10 or 15 of them ended up coming with us, you know, in, in throughout the whole night with enjoying all the celebrations. And, uh, we were like walking through the streets of, of Knoxville and they're doing the, oi, oi, oi cheer. And, uh, it was like you know, something I'll always remember, like that, some awesome videos. That and, sounds like a fun time. That yeah. sounds like a fun time. Who parties hardy, harder, Canadians or Aussies? Because I know Canadians party hard. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I don't know, like the, the Aussies giver, man. Like I'll, you know, they, but they, it was, it was, uh, it was a good combination. And I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll see any like Aussie Canadian um, babies down the road, but maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe from that night, happen. from that night. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. Uh, well, they can name them Jeff or Carl if they're boys. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I want to get back to you mentioned something, and I want to go back to it. We were talking to old school. I asked you where you were in 2003, uh, Lake of the Woods. Uh, you know, I want to get back to that because when I look back in my what I call my training for what I'm doing now, I can pinpoint it to a lake in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania that I felt like was that was my training ground. Um, was the Lake of the Woods that for you, was that your training ground? Do you feel like a lot of what you're doing now came from that fishery? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, we got really good bass fishing, obviously small mouth, some large mouth. Um, and, and so we have grass, we have really clear water, some dirty water, some current. So like, as far as, um, just getting to fish a lot of different c scenarios and techniques and that, like we're, we can do a lot of that stuff. We don't really get to use yeah. the big baits, but then we've got all this like amazing multi-species stuff, walleye, pike and muskie, some crappie. Um, I, I've grown up doing a ton of ice fishing. So like all that together, just kind of, 
you know, I, I, I guess I would say I'm fairly versatile and as far yeah. as, you know, being able to kind of figure, try and figure out any kind of situation that you're in. And it was yeah. a great place to grow up in that regard, like just for all the variety. And like, I, I love, you know, if I can fish offshore, use my electronics against these guys, I'm probably going to, I'm going to have a better chance to do well versus beating the bank. If I got to right. beat the bank, I, I'm, you know, probably not beating these guys, but, right. uh, and a lot of that just comes from like, you know, days and days of staring at a flasher on the ice. And I mean, that's how, that's how I, you know, got good at probably like doing, doing this yeah. with my bait on top of a fish, triggering yep. a bait, having just confidence and seeing your bait. And like, yeah, when I won in Knoxville the first time it was, you know, with all 2d. And I mean, it, right. I take for granted that it's not hard to stay on top of your bait and uh, with your trolling motor and, and not run your line over, but like just right. the bait. Like I, I'm constantly, my bait never leaves that cone. I mean, I'm always yep. on it. And uh, that, a lot of that just comes, I think, from from just growing up fishing that way and, and, and a lot of it from ice fishing. So interesting, the ice fishing analogy. And there's a lot of people, Jeff, that are going to watch this and listen to this. Yeah. that are going to look at us like we got three freaking heads. But yeah. uh, I agree with you, man. I, I've always been a big advocate of even other species, you know, fishing for other species, fishing other ways you can take things and learn things and apply them. Uh, and I think that's a great example, man, ice fishing. Uh, Lake of the Woods, man, for, for people listening and watching that don't know about it, Google it. Go there. It's got a great bunch of lodges and, and guides there. Um uh, Dude, what an amazing place. I I wish I could go back in time and relive those couple years that I was going there. Uh to probably right after I won the classic. I want to say yeah. it was, you know, 2002, three, four, right in that range. Uh I, I stayed at uh I think I was a place called Yellowbird, Thunderbird, yeah. Yellowbird Lodge, Yellowbird something like that. And Totem Lodge, yeah. And Totem Lodge, right. Uh, and it was amazing, dude. Amazing fishing. But we've talk, talked about this story, I think, just between me and you, like over a drink or something. But I want to retell it on the show. Um, I made a friend there, uh, one of the guides. His name was Big Joe. Big yeah. Joe. Monstrous guy. Just a huge man. Uh, yeah. And the first time I met him, we connected because he's kind of like a bass head. You know, yeah. he'd, guide, he'd have to guide for walleye and, and everything, all species. But he was a bass guy. And like the second year I was there, you know, like literally we were sneaking away by ourselves out from the group. And I was there with Dick Sporting Goods as, you know, a as a representative, but we were like sneaking away to bass fish. And I'll never forget this, but that year, you know, like the Senko was just starting to get big and popular, the soft stick bait. And yeah. like, even in the States, like it still wasn't a bait that everyone had tied on. It was sort of like a niche bait. And I remember bringing like a hundred pack up there. And we got in some of those back bays. This was in the fall, I think. And dude, Jeff, we caught like, I mean, we used the whole bag. Like, you yeah. know, we caught a hundred largemouth and it felt like they were fish that never saw a bait. And, you know, he's like, you got to send me these. And I was with Mans at the time. Mans had a version of, of the Senko. And uh, dude, I sent him like a couple hundred packs of these baits. And dude, for like, I think he told me like two years, him and his buddy Hiram, were winning every tournament with <laughs> dude they they were dominant for yeah years like and 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 still um they still fish most of the tournaments and still they always catch them i mean they're they're they, they're really good fishermen but yeah they were dominant for uh for a few years there and we're catching all these big large melts and now looking back like yeah like obviously if you had you're showing those things the first senko like the first senko yeah so that's my my contribution to the canadian fishing culture is that and i i yeah. if i if i don't do anything else i'm glad that that happened it was such such a cool yeah. story no big yeah. joe uh he's an amazing man and, and a good friend and his dad passed away the week before the classic and oh, uh man. i actually talked to him the night before the tournament and i only caught one like honest over four pounder in the tournament and i told him i'm gonna catch him a four pounder tomorrow and i got one on the first day so that one was for uh joe's dad walt and uh wow yeah he he was uh he's a good great guy but yeah giant gentle giant and such a, uh, such a good guy yeah. yeah 
yeah. such a cool experience. Now, I, that brings me to another thing I want you to talk about, because I remember fishing with Joe and he was rocking that same flannel that you had on at the classic. Talk about that, because I think a lot of our viewers or listeners are like, the hell is that flannel? Jeff's wearing. Yeah, like I never grew up being like a big flannel guy, but yeah. uh, the last couple of years, like Sims is a good sponsor that, that I have and uh, they make some nice flannels. They fit good. They're warm and uh, they're comfortable. And yeah. uh, I think I, it, probably last year I was on live a few days and I, you know, I got out of Wahi. I was wearing one and like, it was just kind of chilly in the morning. So uh, yeah, it's just kind of turned into a thing. So now if it's, if it's, if it's kind of kind of chilly, cool. You need to layer up a little bit. Then for me, it's it's going to be a flannel. And they've got some now that like have hoods built into them. That's um, awesome. So yeah, that's it's it's my thing. Swindle, like you know, he's hilarious all the time and never really turns it off. But he, man, like he just gives it to me in the morning, and it's funny. But like <laughs> he, he'll just be like out of the blue, like, "Hey, boy, are you going to go cut a tree down on your way to the way in?" Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's, he's great. He's been giving me lip since the moment I met him. So, uh, yeah. I, I know how that is, but no, it's great. I love it because I think it's, you know, it's part of like your branding now, which is really cool. And, and yeah. you have to have that, you know, it's like an identifiable thing, which yeah. is super cool. Um, I, I, I want to switch gears a little bit. And as we get to the end of this thing and talk a little bit about, you know, um, your traveling partner. Uh, and, and I know early in your career, you travel with, uh, the Johnston brothers and, um, uh, recent, yeah. And more recently traveling with Jason Christie. Yeah. Has that, you, you know, and I'm saying this from personal experience because I've got, uh, I've got the chance to travel different ways over the years myself. And for me personally, my fishing and even my mentality changes as you travel with different people did did that happen or is that happening with you now tra traveling with Jason and t talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's gotta be, it's gotta be different traveling with Jason versus traveling with the Johnston brothers, especially well, when my, they were a little more crazy a couple years ago, you know? Yeah, no, my first few years on the elite series, it was with the Johnstons, Chris Grohl and fighter. And then crazy. Um, <laughs> and then Matt came around the last couple of years and then he was in the group too. So like we had so much fun, like we've had a lot of good times with those guys, but then in the last few years, like Shelby's able to come. Yeah. Um, so she doesn't want to stay with all those guys, right? Like nobody yeah. cleans anything up. Um, she's not <laughs> like a frat party. Them. Every turn of it's a frat party. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so Shelby and Jason's fiance, Shanna hit it off a couple of years ago and that's kind of, like I knew Jason, but we weren't, you know, we weren't yeah. like chatting it up all the time or anything. Yeah. Um, so last year, uh, yeah, we, we sort of, we, we stayed together and uh, yeah, it's rubbed off on me, like in a, in a really good way. Um, just, you know how he's just always calm, right? Like nothing, yeah. nothing very, really very him. even, very he can even. Have a bad day. And like when he gets back to the house, you know, obviously he's never happy if he does, but like you're, you, you're never hearing him like, be a baby or lying yeah in. yeah um, and then like around this time last year we spent a week at their place in between i think between fork and pickwick so we fished a couple days and i mean i've got to fish with a lot of these guys and the one thing that like you pick up is it's not secret lures it's not uh, you know sneaky stuff a most right. of the time it's it's do things the right way like just make good casts right be quiet in the boat. Like a lot of the simple things, those, you know, guys like him just do all that, make it look easy. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah, I think it's rubbed off on me just, just, just cause he's easy to be around and we've got to be really good friends and, uh, yeah, it's, we have a good time. Like I, I look forward to, you know, we're, we're back at it again next week and, yeah. um, yeah, we're very lucky. Like Shelby and Shanna, like we we usually get a pretty pretty good dinner at night when we're when we get in, and uh, that's important. That's yeah, important. We, yeah, we've been having it's been a lot of fun, and um, so yeah, all all good. Yeah, Did, ha, has he rubbed off too on the mental side? Like, because I know uh, you know when I was traveling with like um, John Cruz and Ish Monroe, the, those guys were dominant sight fishermen and sh and shallow water flippers and froggers. And they rubbed off on me uh, because mm -hmm. I had those same opportunities to fit fun fish with them. But they, you know, guys have also rubbed off on me like mentally, uh, you, you know, taking pieces of their mental strategy. 
has has that happened with Jason and, and and even like to the next level? Like this might be a strange question, but did did that in a way help you maybe win the classic? Was your mentality different? Like if you were traveling with the Motley Crew, yeah, do you win the classic this year? <laughs> yeah, maybe not. I mean, I and mean, that's what I mean. Like me the mental side of it is where. Yeah, just because he's calm and and yeah. uh, like on the the third morning of the classic, he was around tenth place, eighth place. Like he was tied up at the dock in the morning. Yeah. And like you know, it was crazy. And I needed to like get away a little bit. And and everybody's intimidated by Jason, and they shouldn't be, but they are. And I ended up walking down and just sort of jumped in his boat for a few minutes because I knew that no one's gonna like come in between him and I and, and <laughs> yeah. I am like get an in another interview or do whatever. And it was just, you know, he didn't have to tell me anything. I mean, I knew it was just, you know, he's just, he's easy to be around and, yeah. uh, and that's, that's kind of what, what rubs off, but yeah, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I think it's working. Um, Cause both you guys are, are doing really, really good. Uh, all right, Gussie, we're gonna play a little game. Uh, we got to Got to end on something funny here. Uh, yeah. I'm going to give you, let's see, I'm going to give you a, Let's see. I'm going to give you about six or seven terms, and I have the correct definition, and you just got to tell me what they mean, okay? Yeah. And and uh, for a lot of our listeners, remember, a lot of our listeners, dude, they're they're freaking derelicts like me, living in all over the country and cities, and they're they're just they're no good, just like me. Uh, here we go, in no particular order, and these are all Canadian slang terms, and you have to tell me the definition. All right, first one's going to be super easy. Moping. What the heck is moping? So, yeah, that drives people nuts, but that's what I call the – no one in Canada nor calls it a Demiki rig. Like, we just right. – I'm not calling it that. But I know I say it sometimes because people know what I mean. But uh, the late Ron Linder, um, those guys kind of developed – were part of developing that hanging a jerk shad above fish, walleyes, and smallmouths that you see on your sonar. And Ron yeah. started calling it moping because you're kind of like this – looking at your screen um and that's where that came from that's a good one all right next one chesterfield chesterfield yeah so that's like your your grandma's old beat up dusty couch um <laughs> in the basement i have one of the i actually have one and i'm looking at one in the other part of the studio right here we have a chesterfield it's, it's funny when i wrote that one down i thought it was like a pack of cigarettes i'm like yeah chesterfield's like yeah guys still smoke chesterfield's yeah. but it's a couch it's not yeah. all right that was easy all right this is another one that i got completely wrong because i thought it was an animal newfie what's a newfie so Newfie is a person from newfoundland so that's a province on our far north uh, east coast and they all have like the strongest like any of the real um famous canadian accents or the things that americans really make fun like a boot um, yeah yeah that they really make fun of us for all those um um that all comes from the newfoundland people so we'd get newfies that would come and guide at some of the fishing resorts uh, on lake of the woods in the summer so i know quite a few of them and uh, yeah. they're, they're they can party those guys can they're known to party. That's great. We actually, uh, my wife and I got to spend some time there last year for my birthday. She took me for, it was dude, beautiful, beautiful. But I was, the, I was even saying it wrong. I'm like, yeah, we're going to Newfoundland. And they're like, no, it's Newfoundland. I'm like, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> saying it wrong I'm from Jersey. <laughs> I can't help it. All right. A couple more double, double. I thought this one was food. It is kind of food related, but I thought yeah. it was like a burger. Double, double. What the hell is a double, double? Oh, well, Tim Hortons is our like famous. That's the most, you know, that's like the Dunkin Donuts of Canada. Yeah. Tim Hortons coffee shop. So you pull up to the window and you want a, uh, a coffee with two cream and two sugar. You just say a double, double. Yeah. All right. Double, and we're going to give you one more. This one I like because I, I, I can relate to this one. A Mickey. What's a Mickey. So a Mickey is um, the size the size of an alcohol bottle below a twenty sixer. I don't know. Is that a one liter or a, a three? But it's like a three three seven five or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's the small bottle. Yeah, it's not the handle. It. It's the one below the handle bottle, right? It's that mid sized liquor. No, bottle. the Mickey's the small one. The Mickey's Oh, the small the small one. one. Like a, yeah, like it would be like carrying a flask around. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. twenty sixer, a forty, and then a a handle is a sixty. 
Okay, so that's what uh, a Pete Glusick, who's normally on these shows, carries a Mickey with him every show. Okay. Uh, and he says it's coffee. All right. Uh, one last thing, and I had this in my notes and I forgot it, but it's a great way to end this. And uh, and and this is me being honest. And I have to tell this story because it's sort of embarrassing and um, just I was so wrong. This is the morning of the first day of the classic, Jeff. Okay. And Becky and I are in Knoxville. Uh, we're sitting down. We found a, a little crepe crepery shop, coffee crepery shop that opened up. We sat down and you guys haven't even started yet. And Beck's like, who do you think's going to win? And we're like looking at the list of names and I, and I've got my paper and I'm like looking down the list and you know, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, and I hadn't made a decision. She's and and Becky's like, hey, Gussie's Gussie's gonna have a good chance to win. He won here before. He's gonna have a good chance to win. And I'm like, I swear, this is exactly what I said. I'm like, I'm like, listen, Beck, there's no way in hell Gussie's gonna win because when you win at a place and never you give won. it away, it ne you can never do that again. I'm like, he's not gonna win. I'm like, he's gonna want to do that. That shit's gonna be so beat up. There's no way. And I had, I, and later that day, I was live on that deal that uh, Bowman does. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, dude, I'm watching as you're jacking them. And I had to eat my words. I even tell, the, I told the story on that live too. And I apologize for doubting you, Jeff, for doubting you. <laughs> you did a great job. Uh, but it's amazing. It, it's just amazing to me that you beat the odds and you won the Bassmaster Classic and you're, you're a classic champ, dude. And, uh, Man, it's it's such a great honor, and uh, I think you're going to be a great champ, uh, and and very proud of you. Very proud of you for winning that tournament, man. No, it's thanks, been man. I a lot of little things kind of went my way, and you know how you know that that anytime you win, that's got to happen. But tell Becky thanks for the for <laughs> appreciate. She's she's in the good books now. Yeah, and but also, put, put her on the good side. Yeah. Uh, congrats on the Hall of Fame thing too, man. That's thank that's, you. That's huge. Yep. The thank you. Feels feels good. Feels good uh, in a good group there, and very very humbled by that. But uh, Jeff, thanks for coming on, dude. This was great. Uh, it, you're you're a special guest. When I look back in the thirty years, hopefully of this show, we were already ten in, so I can make another twenty. Uh, this is a this is an important show because you are the first one on this new format. I had so much fun with you today. Thanks for coming on the show. And here's the other thing: I'm going to see you in like I don't know, like three or four days. I'm going to I'm going to yeah. see you at Lay Lake. So. So safe travels, and uh, we'll see you over there. Okay, take care, guys. Thanks again for having me. Thanks, Gussie. We'll see you. There you have it, everybody. Uh, what a what a great champion. Um, I, I I kind of was trying to corner him on the the importance of what has happened in his life, and and I think he's going to be a great champion. Winning the classic, man, is a life changer, and uh, and he's going to change people's lives whether he knows it or not. And that's a really cool thing, man. Um, you know, there's not that many classic champs walking the face of the earth and he's one of them and he's going to have an impact on the sport. He's going to have an impact on people, getting people fishing, getting people to change their lives. That's a, that's heavy, man. That's heavy to have that pressure. Uh, but I, I can tell, I, I can tell he's going to be a great champion and, uh, my hat's off to him for winning that, especially the way he won. Uh, here's here's the thing. This is Ike Live. This is a new format, but it's the same old show. Uh, and we're going to be posting these, and we want to hear feedback. We want to hear your comments. Please comment on these shows. Please leave us messaging. Uh, it's really going to help us as we progress in this new format. And even to the point where we're going to use your ideas and maybe even bring you into a show. So leave comments, leave a way to get a hold of you, uh, and, and we're going to use that. Now, remember what I said, Mystery Tackle Box, great, great product, sponsor the show day one. Use the promo code Ike Live, and you're going to get 50% off your first uh, Pro Box, 30% off your first Elite Box. And even though the format of the show has changed, the one thing that has not is... This is the only show that does a live unboxing. We're going to do it right now. Look at this. You heard me say it before. That seal. Dude, when this box comes to the house, 
my favorite thing is, you know, I'm you're excited because it's like Christmas and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you take the box off the front step. And here's this, what is in this box? It's like, it's like this magical moment. But it all comes together when you hear this sound. Okay, listen, ready? That's right. You hear that? That's the seal breaking. I love that sound. And then the pop. Pop of the box. But we're going to open a box. I'm going to show you a couple things that are in here that uh, catch my eye. Uh, and this is the great thing about this box is uh, gets a lot of new things in your hands. Okay, so we've got hard baits, soft baits. We've got hooks in here. Uh, we've got, uh, oh man, we got so much stuff. Judge. I'm, I'm trying to pick a couple things here. I'm going to give you, oh boy, I'm going to give you, let's see, I'm going to give you two things here. Um, I'm going to focus on two things, but I'll show you some of the other stuff. These boxes are loaded. Uh, we've got X zone crawls. We've got grande bass uh, creatures. We've got Carl's June bug worms. Oh my gosh, has there ever been a better color than a June bug trick worm, finesse worm? We've got hooks. We've got a clown colored jerk bait. We've got a slash bait. We've got a shallow diving square bill, chartreuse, black back. Come on, dirty water color, great. But here's the two I really like, and I want to show you. Uh, this is a bait by Weston that's a whopper plopper style bait. But it has two props in the back instead of one. So this is cool. Like this is one that I'll put in my box. Uh, I can imagine a different sound, uh, a different action. You know, everybody's throwing a whopper plopper with one prop. Now you've got two. I like that. And then we've got the fish hoey lures. I like the name fish hoey. I like fish hose. Got one sitting behind me right now. Uh, we've got. You didn't think this show was going to get any less uh, controversial. Uh, we've got this crawl that's very interesting. Two things. The color, it's almost like a light purple, almost like cinnamon brown. But what I like about it is big crawl body, little thin arms. So a lot of times you see a fat body with fat arms or a small crawl with little arms. Here's a big body with little arms, and that's a fish hoey lures crawl. Uh, another one that I'd like to try out. So a uh, good representation of what's in those MTB boxes. Go to mysterytacklebox.com. Use that promo code Ike Live, uh, and you're going to get 30% off the Elite, 50% off the Pro Box. Uh, it's a great deal. Uh, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Ike Live. I hope you like this new format, getting a little bit up close and personal uh, with these guys. And we had Gussie on, a uh, great champion. Uh, also, don't forget to go over to ikefoundation.org. we got a kids tournament coming up on May 20th. Uh, also have our Celebrity Pro-Am coming up on June 10th. Head over there uh, and check that out. Help get kids fishing. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, we've got a great one coming up next. Uh, Mark Menendez joining us in the next Ike Live podcast. And uh, let's have the co-producer come in here and say hello and goodbye all at the same time. So I hope you enjoyed it. We got a lot more coming. Brand new Ike Live. We'll see you soon. Bye. Hit this right here. Hit this. Hit this. You know, right now where we're standing, we're in Camden, New Jersey. Yeah. Philadelphia is right there. This is the concrete jungle. And, you know, a lot of those kids, as they grow up, they don't fish. It's interesting because they're surrounded by water. You know, the, the Delaware River, the Schuylkill, ponds, city park lakes. But they don't have the influence to, to, to cast, to fish, to have a rod and reel. And that really, that became our focus, you yeah. know, is to target kids in what we call non-traditional areas, yeah. you know, urban areas, city centers, where the population's high. And, and let these kids have the experience, you know, and it, it, it's amazing. I mean, some of the experiences we've had, whether it's Central Park in New York City, here in Camden, other parts of the country, even just casting. Yeah. It's unbelievable to see it, isn't it? Yes. It's unbelievable. Yes. A and, uh, you know, you see these kids have this experience they've never had, and they light up, you know? 
the big thing I think for the Ike Foundation is we're not we're not saying we want all these kids to become professional anglers. Yeah. It'd be great if some of them did, but we want them to have that fishing experience because it ties them to so much so many other positive things. The outdoors, nature, conservation, conservation. Uh, ecology, um, you know, all these amazing things in life that maybe they wouldn't have been exposed to any other way, we're trying to help with that. So it's, it's important, it's important for us. Yeah. We're proud of it. Four and a half inch drop shot worm, Bama bug. Finesse jig, PB and J, give me something hard. Hey, KVD here. Now, I didn't always know this much about fishing. Three-aught, no, four-aught EWG worm hook. In fact, there was a time when I couldn't tell the difference between a jerk bait and a stick bait. But then I signed up for Mystery Tackle Box, the original monthly tackle subscription. And now I know more about fishing than I do about calculus. And he knows a lot about calculus. Plus, I get amazing extras like free fishing magazines. October 2016. Featured article, four places to throw a frog. Exclusive decals, <coughs> zombie bass. And how-to videos for all the great baits I receive. How to tune a crankbait. Is that underwater footage I smell? I got goosebumps. So if you're looking to develop enhanced fishing abilities like me, or you just like getting new tackle every month, go to mysterytacklebox.com and get your box today. <laughs>